I do think that the discovery of rapamycin is the place to begin this because, you know, there's a very unique uh, <laughs> uh, phenomenon here, which is the drug was discovered before the target and the target is named after the drug in response to that. So David, <clears throat> you and I got to visit this very special place where the bacteria that ultimately produced this drug was discovered. We, we certainly have plans to go back. It's on our, it's on our list of things to do in the next few years and we shall. Um, do you want to give folks the, the story of, of how this, this, this molecule rapamycin came to be? Sure, sure. And I, I hope uh, I hope we'll go back soon and I hope Matt will come as well. He certainly will. <laughs> Anyone who yeah, cares yeah, about Rapa Nui. For the record, uh, I did try to get this recording done on Rapa Nui. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> we'll, we'll, be so doing, we'll be doing another one there for sure. <laughs> well, as, as you know, Peter, there, there were in our attempts by pharmaceutical companies to collect soil samples and other biological containing samples throughout the world. And, and there Wyeth Ayerst did come into possession of a soil sample from Easter Island, uh, otherwise known as Rapa Nui in the, in the South Pacific, at one point claimed to be the most remote island of the world. I think it's, it's actually technically not, but very far from anything. And in that soil sample, actually in, in Canada, people eventually isolated bacteria from it, bacteria called um, Streptomyces hygropicus. And from that bacteria, rapamycin was eventually isolated and in deference to Rapa Nui was named rapamycin. Now, ironically, it turns out when people have looked for rapamycin and, and other bacteria throughout the world, and in fact, even the same bacteria, it actually has been found in many other places, but it did come originally from rapamycin. Um, and, and like was done at the time, these molecules, that these, these bacterial products, what you, you really would call an antibiotic, it did come from bacteria, uh, were tested, you know, in many different assays. And I actually think, and Matt may, may, may correct me, I think some of the earlier assays were actually immunological assays, even before some of the uh, antifungal assays. Uh, and, and that eventually led many decades after to pursuing it as an immunosuppressant. But in the meantime, it was also found to have antifungal agent activity. And that's where some of the genetics of rapamycin and some of the targets uh, were first identified because of the ease of genetics. Um, so this is a story that began, I think the original soil samples may have even been in the 60s. Yeah, I think it was 66 or 67 yeah. soil samples. And then exactly. Seren, I don't think, really got around to digging into it until 71 or 72. Exactly. And, and then he championed it. In fact, you know, one of my most valued possessions that when I started working on rapamycin, we, we, we didn't have much. And, and Saul Snyder, my advisor, wrote Seren and asked for some. He sent us many grams, which I later <laughs> calculated had a street value of many hundreds of thousands of dollars if, if it had, uh, if one could sell it like that. And a, and a really nice note wishing me luck. And the entire bibliography of Rapamice at that time, which consisted of his papers and a couple of abstracts. So it's a, it's a, it's a little thin book uh, at the time. And he is the one who championed it. And eventually it took, the, the clinical path took way too long. And I think that even impacted some of its utility because the patents expired, I think, before uh, you, know, you could really sort of capture some of the value of it. So we're talking about something now that's in the 50 year range plus, right? And I think a question that we could ask ourselves, and I think we will, is rapamycin as good as it gets, right? There obviously are der derivatives of rapamycin, but even in this pathway, which as Matt says, exceedingly complicated, are there other targets that we should be pursuing that may actually have equal or better impacts on the aging process? So I think, you know, something David said there, we may again also touch on, which is the, the clinical path not only took too long, but I think you can make an argument that the clinical path has actually maybe negatively impacted the development of rapamycin and other mTOR inhibitors for other uses. Because it was developed clinically as an organ transplant immunosuppressant, and that's how it was first approved, it was used in a dosing protocol and a patient context where there are lots of side effects. And I think we are still learning what the side effect profile actually looks like for rapamycin at lower doses in patients who are not immunocompromised and haven't had and organ transplant. So, so I do wonder whether the history of rapamycin and the rapidity at which it, 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 it will be eventually tested for other endpoints in clinical trials where it may have benefits has been negatively impacted and slowed down because of the, the reputation that the drug got as a dangerous drug um, based on the way it was developed clinically. So I think that's an important 
piece of the puzzle here to think about. Yeah, just to give some numbers to it, right? The first paper that Seren Segal put out there describing the chemical composition of rapamycin, if I'm not mistaken, was about 1971, 1972. The FDA approval for rapamycin in humans was 1999. Just to give you a sense of what you're both talking about here in terms of an enormous gap of time between, you know, when you sort of make a, a chemical discovery, file an IND and work all your way through. Second point I'd make is, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a former surgical resident who, so, so, you know, I was in my surgical residency taking care of transplant patients when rapamycin was in full use. Now, again, it's interesting, David, another drug that the whole reason you got involved in rapamycin was because of FK506, which was uh, uh, another dr cousin of rapamycin um, that, if, if I recall, the whole reason your lab was using rapa was as a control that didn't have sort of the calcineric uh, properties of FK506, but that's sort of a, an interesting footnote. Um, but we were giving rapamycin out constantly. And to your point, Matt, it was a drug that was typically given two to three milligrams a day every single day, but with three other drugs, right? You were also getting prednisone, Celcept, MMF. You were getting very, very toxic drugs because you needed to completely shut down the cellular immune system of a patient who had just received a foreign organ. And I think that speaks to this point, right, which is for, you know, the better part of a decade, 1999 to 2009, the only experience that the scientific world has with this is in that context. And yeah, you're going to see a lot of side effects, but how do you know they're from rapamycin? I mean, and how do you know that they would be the same elsewhere? Mm -hmm.